Chapter 3, Part C of The Wealth of Nations, Book 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Book 5, Chapter 3, Part C of Public Debts. The extension of the Custom House Laws of Great Britain to Ireland and the Plantations provided it was accompanied, as in justice it ought to be, with an extension of the freedom of trade, would be in the highest degree advantageous to both. All the invidious restraints which at present oppress the trade of Ireland, the distinction between the enumerated and non-enumerated commodities of America, would be entirely at an end. The countries north of Cape Finisterre would be as open to every part of the produce of America as those south of that Cape are to some parts of that produce at present. The trade between all the different parts of the British Empire would, in consequence of this uniformity in the Custom House laws, be as free as the coasting trade of Great Britain is at present. The British Empire would thus afford, within itself, an immense internal market for every part of the produce of all its different provinces. So great an extension of market would soon compensate, both to Ireland and the plantations, all that they could suffer from the increase of the duties of customs. The excise is the only part of the British system of taxation which would require to be varied in any respect, according as it was applied to the different provinces of the empire. It might be applied to Ireland without any variation, the produce and consumption of that kingdom being exactly of the same nature with those of Great Britain. In its application to America and the West Indies, of which the produce and consumption are so very different from those of Great Britain, some modification might be necessary, in the same manner as in its application to the cider and beer counties of England. A fermented liquor, for example, which is called beer, but which, as it is made of molasses, bears very little resemblance to our beer, makes a considerable part of the common drink of the people in America. This liquor, as it can be kept only for a few days, cannot, like our beer, be prepared and stored up for sale in great breweries, but every private family must brew it for their own use, in the same manner as they cook their victuals. But to subject every private family to the odious visits and examination of the tax-gatherers, in the same manner as we subject the keepers of alehouses and the brewers for public sale, would be altogether inconsistent with liberty. If, for the sake of equality, it was thought necessary to lay a tax upon this liquor, it might be taxed by taxing the material of which it is made, either at the place of manufacture, or, if the circumstances of the trade rendered such an excise improper, by laying a duty upon its importation into the colony in which it was to be consumed. Besides the duty of one penny a gallon imposed by the British Parliament upon the importation of molasses into America, there is a provincial tax of this kind upon their importation into Massachusetts Bay, in ships belonging to any other colony, of eightpence the hogshead, and another upon their importation from the northern colonies into South Carolina, of fivepence the gallon. Or, if neither of these methods was found convenient, each family might compound for its consumption of this liquor, either according to the number of persons of which it consisted, in the same manner as private families compound for the malt tax in England, or according to the different ages and sexes of those persons, in the same manner as several different taxes are levied in Holland, or, nearly as Sir Matthew Decker proposes, that all taxes upon consumable commodities should be levied in England. This mode of taxation, it has already been observed, when applied to objects of a speedy consumption, is not a very convenient one. It might be adopted, however, in cases where no better could be done. Sugar, rum, and tobacco are commodities which are nowhere necessaries of life, which are become objects of almost universal consumption, and which are, therefore, extremely proper subjects of taxation. If a union with the colonies were to take place, those commodities might be taxed, either before they go out of the hands of the manufacturer or grower, or, if this mode of taxation did not suit the circumstances of those persons, they might be deposited in public warehouses, both at the place of manufacture and at all the different ports of the empire to which they might afterwards be transported to remain there under the joint custody of the owner and the revenue officer till such time as they should be delivered out either to the consumer to the merchant retailer for home consumption or to the merchant exporter the tax not to be advanced till such delivery 
when delivered out for exportation, to go duty-free, upon proper security being given, that they should really be exported out of the empire. These are, perhaps, the principal commodities, with regard to which the union with the colonies might require some considerable change in the present system of British taxation. What might be the amount of the revenue which this system of taxation, extended to all the different provinces of the empire, might produce, it must, no doubt, be altogether impossible to ascertain with tolerable exactness. By means of this system, there is annually levied in Great Britain, upon less than eight millions of people, more than ten millions of revenue. Ireland contains more than two millions of people, and, according to the accounts laid before the Congress, the twelve associated provinces of America contain more than three. Those accounts, however, may have been exaggerated, in order perhaps either to encourage their own people, or to intimidate those of this country, and we shall suppose, therefore, that our North American and West Indian colonies, taken together, contain no more than three millions, or that the whole British Empire, in Europe and America, contains no more than thirteen millions of inhabitants. If, upon less than eight millions of inhabitants, this system of taxation raises a revenue of more than ten million sterling, it ought, upon thirteen millions of inhabitants, to raise a revenue of more than sixteen millions two hundred and fifty thousand pounds sterling. From this revenue, supposing that this system could produce it, must be deducted the revenue usually raised in Ireland and the plantations for defraying the expense of the respective civil governments. The expense of the civil and military establishment of Ireland, together with the interest of the public debt, amounts, at a medium of the two years which ended March 1775, to something less than seven hundred and fifty thousand pounds a year by a very exact account of the revenue of the principal colonies of america and the west indies it amounted before the commencement of the present disturbances to a hundred and forty one thousand eight hundred pounds in this account however the revenue of maryland of north carolina and of all our late acquisitions both upon the continent and in the islands is omitted which may perhaps make a difference of thirty or forty thousand pounds. For the sake of even numbers, therefore, let us suppose that the revenue necessary for supporting the civil government of Ireland and the plantations may amount to a million. There would remain, consequently, a revenue of fifteen millions two hundred and fifty thousand pounds, to be applied towards defraying the general expense of the empire and towards paying the public debt. But if, from the present revenue of Great Britain, a million could, in peaceable times, be spared towards the payment of that debt, six millions two hundred and fifty thousand pounds could very well be spared from this improved revenue. This great sinking fund, too, might be augmented every year by the interest of the debt which had been discharged the year before, and might, in this manner, increase so very rapidly as to be sufficient in a few years to discharge the whole debt and thus to restore completely the at present debilitated and languishing vigor of the empire. In the meantime, the people might be relieved from some of the most burdensome taxes, from those which are imposed either upon the necessaries of life or upon the materials of manufacture. The laboring poor would thus be enabled to live better, to work cheaper, and to send their goods cheaper to market. The cheapness of their goods would increase the demand for them, and consequently for the labor of those who produce them. This increase in the demand for labor would both increase the numbers and improve the circumstances of the laboring poor. Their consumption would increase, and, together with it, the revenue arising from all those articles of their consumption upon which the taxes might be allowed to remain. The revenue arising from this system of taxation, however, might not immediately increase in proportion to the number of people who were subjected to it great indulgence would for some time be due to those provinces of the empire which were thus subjected to burdens to which they had not before been accustomed and even when the same taxes came to be levied everywhere exactly as possible they would not everywhere produce a revenue proportioned to the numbers of the people in a poor country the consumption of the principal commodities subject to the duties of customs and excise is very small and in a thinly inhabited country the opportunities of smuggling are very great the consumption of malt liquors among the inferior ranks of people in Scotland is very small, and the excise upon malt, beer, and ale produces less there than in England, in proportion to the numbers of the people and the rate of the duties, which upon malt is different, on account of a supposed difference of quality. 
in these particular branches of the excise there is not i apprehend much more smuggling in the one country than in the other the duties upon the distillery and the greater part of the duties of customs in proportion to the numbers of people in the respective countries produce less in scotland than in england not only on account of the smaller consumption of the taxed commodities but of the much greater facility of smuggling in ireland the inferior ranks of people are still poorer than in scotland and many parts of the country are almost as thinly inhabited in ireland therefore the consumption of the taxed commodities might in proportion to the number of the people be still less than in scotland and the facility of smuggling nearly the same in america and the west indies the white people even of the lowest rank are in much better circumstances than those of the same rank in england and their consumption of all the luxuries in which they usually indulge themselves is probably much greater the blacks indeed who make the greater part of the inhabitants both of the southern colonies upon the continent and of the west india islands as they are in a state of slavery are no doubt in a worse condition than the poorest people either in scotland or ireland we must not however upon that account imagine that they are worse fed or that their consumption of articles which might be subjected to moderate duties is less than that even of the lower ranks of people in england in order that they may work well it is in the interest of their master that they should be fed well and kept in good heart in the same manner as it is his interest that his working cattle should be so the blacks accordingly have almost everywhere their allowance of rum and molasses or spruce beer in the same manner as the white servants and this allowance would not probably be withdrawn though those articles should be subjected to moderate duties the consumption of the taxed commodities therefore in proportion to the number of inhabitants would probably be as great in america and the west indies as in any part of the british empire the opportunities of smuggling indeed would be much greater america in proportion to the extent of the country being much more thinly inhabited than either scotland or ireland if the revenue however which is at present raised by the different duties upon malt and malt liquors were to be levied by a single duty upon malt the opportunity of smuggling in the most important branch of the excise would be almost entirely taken away and if the duties of customs instead of being imposed upon almost all the different articles of importation were confined to a few of the most general use and consumption and if the levying of those duties were subjected to the excise laws the opportunity of smuggling though not so entirely taken away would be very much diminished in consequence of those two apparently very simple and easy alterations the duties of customs and excise might probably produce a revenue as great in proportion to the consumption of the most thinly inhabited province as they do at present in proportion to that of the most populous the americans it has been said indeed have no gold or silver money the interior commerce of the country being carried on by a paper currency and the gold and silver which occasionally come among them being all sent to great britain in return for the commodities which they receive from us but without gold and silver it is added there is no possibility of paying taxes we already get all the gold and silver which they have how is it possible to draw from them what they have not the present scarcity of gold and silver money in america is not the effect of the poverty of that country or of the inability of the people there to purchase those metals in a country where the wages of labor are so much higher and the price of provisions so much lower than in england the greater part of the people must surely have wherewithal to purchase a greater quantity if it were either necessary or convenient for them to do so the scarcity of those metals therefore must be the effect of choice and not of necessity it is for transacting either domestic or foreign business that gold or silver money is either necessary or convenient the domestic business of every country it has been shown in the second book of this inquiry may at least in peaceable times be transacted by means of a paper currency with nearly the same degree of conveniency as by gold and silver money it is convenient for the americans who could always employ with profit in the improvement of their lands a greater stock than they can easily get to save as much as possible the expense of so costly an instrument of commerce as gold and silver and rather to employ that part of their surplus produce which would be necessary for purchasing those metals in purchasing the instruments of trade the materials of clothing several parts of household furniture and the ironwork necessary for building and extending their settlements and plantations 
in purchasing not dead stock, but active and productive stock. The colony governments find it for their interest to supply the people with such a quantity of paper money as is fully sufficient, and generally more than sufficient, for transacting their domestic business. Some of those governments, that of Pennsylvania particularly, derive a revenue from lending this paper money to their subjects, at an interest of so much per cent. Others, like that of Massachusetts Bay, advance, upon extraordinary emergencies, a paper money of this kind for defraying the public expense, and afterwards, when it suits the conveniency of the colony, redeem it at the depreciated value to which it gradually falls. In 1747, that colony paid in this manner the greater part of its public debts, with the tenth part of the money for which its bills had been granted. It suits the conveniency of the planters to save the expense of employing gold and silver money in their domestic transactions, and it suits the conveniency of the colony governments to supply them with a medium, which, though attended with some very considerable disadvantages, enables them to save that expense. The redundancy of paper money necessarily banishes gold and silver from the domestic transactions of the colonies, for the same reason that it has banished those metals from the greater part of the domestic transactions in Scotland. And in both countries, it is not the poverty, but the enterprising and projecting spirit of the people, their desire of employing all the stock which they can get, as active and productive stock, which has occasioned this redundancy of paper money. In the exterior commerce which the different colonies carry on with Great Britain, gold and silver are more or less employed, exactly in proportion as they are more or less necessary. Where those metals are not necessary, they seldom appear. Where they are necessary, they are generally found. In the commerce between Great Britain and the tobacco colonies, the British goods are generally advanced to the colonists at a pretty long credit, and are afterwards paid for in tobacco, rated at a certain price. It is more convenient for the colonists to pay in tobacco than in gold and silver. It would be more convenient for any merchant to pay for the goods which his correspondents had sold to him, in some other sort of goods which he might happen to deal in, than in money. Such a merchant would have no occasion to keep any part of his stock by him unemployed, and in ready money, for answering occasional demands. He could have at all times a larger quantity of goods in his shop or warehouse, and he could deal to a greater extent. But it seldom happens to be convenient for all the correspondents of a merchant to receive payment for the goods which they sell to him, in goods of some other kind which he happens to deal in. The British merchants who trade to Virginia and Maryland happen to be a particular set of correspondents, to whom it is more convenient to receive payment for the goods which they sell to those colonies in tobacco than in gold and silver. They expect to make a profit by the sale of the tobacco. They could make none by that of the gold and silver. Gold and silver, therefore, very seldom appear in the commerce between Great Britain and the tobacco colonies. Maryland and Virginia have as little occasion for those metals in their foreign as in their domestic commerce. They are said, accordingly, to have less gold and silver money than any other colonies in America. They are reckoned, however, as thriving, and consequently as rich, as any of their neighbors. In the northern colonies, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, the four governments of New England, etc., the value of their own produce which they export to Great Britain is not equal to that of the manufactures which they import for their own use, and for that of some of the other colonies to which they are carriers. A balance, therefore, must be paid to the mother country in gold and silver, and this balance they generally find. In the sugar colonies, the value of the produce annually exported to Great Britain is much greater than that of all the goods imported from thence. If the sugar and rum annually sent to the mother country were paid for in those colonies, Great Britain would be obliged to send out, every year, a very large balance in money, and the trade to the West Indies would, by a certain species of politicians, be considered as extremely disadvantageous. But it so happens that many of the principal proprietors of the sugar plantations reside in Great Britain. Their rents are remitted to them in sugar and rum, the produce of their estates. The sugar and rum which the West India merchants purchase in those colonies upon their own account are not equal in value to the goods which they annually sell there. A balance, therefore, must necessarily be paid to them in gold and silver, and this balance, too, is generally found. 
the difficulty and irregularity of payment from the different colonies to great britain have not been at all in proportion to the greatness or smallness of the balances which were respectively due from them payments have in general been more regular from the northern than from the tobacco colonies though the former have generally paid a pretty large balance in money while the latter have either paid no balance or a much smaller one the difficulty of getting payment from our different sugar colonies has been greater or less in proportion not so much to the extent of the balances respectively due from them as to the quantity of uncultivated land which they contained that is to the greater or smaller temptation which the planters have been under of over-trading or of undertaking the settlement and plantation of greater quantities of waste land than suited the extent of their capitals the returns from the great island of jamaica where there is still much uncultivated land have upon this account been in general more irregular and uncertain than those from the smaller islands of barbados antigua and st christopher's which have for these many years been completely cultivated and have upon that account afforded less field for the speculations of the planter the new acquisitions of grenada tobago st vincent's and dominica have opened a new field for speculations of this kind and the returns from those islands have of late been as irregular and uncertain as those from the great island of jamaica it is not therefore the poverty of the colonies which occasions in the greater part of them the present scarcity of gold and silver money their great demand for active and productive stock makes it convenient for them to have as little dead stock as possible and disposes them upon that account to content themselves with a cheaper though less commodious instrument of commerce than gold and silver they are thereby enabled to convert the value of that gold and silver into the instruments of trade into the materials of clothing into household furniture and into the iron work necessary for building and extending their settlements and plantations in those branches of business which cannot be transacted without gold and silver money it appears that they can always find the necessary quantity of those metals and if they frequently do not find it their failure is generally the effect not of their necessary poverty but of their unnecessary and excessive enterprise it is not because they are poor that their payments are irregular and uncertain but because they are too eager to become excessively rich though all that part of the produce of the colony taxes which was over and above what was necessary for defraying the expense of their own civil and military establishments were to be remitted to great britain in gold and silver the colonies have abundant wherewithal to purchase the requisite quantity of those metals they would in this case be obliged indeed to exchange a part of their surplus produce with which they now purchase active and productive stock for dead stock in transacting their domestic business they would be obliged to employ a costly instead of a cheap instrument of commerce and the expense of purchasing this costly instrument might damp somewhat the vivacity and order of their excessive enterprise in the improvement of land it might not however be necessary to remit any part of the american revenue in gold and silver it might be remitted in bills drawn upon and accepted by particular merchants or companies in great britain to whom a part of the surplus produce of america had been consigned who would pay into the treasury the american revenue in money after having themselves received the value of it in goods and the whole business might frequently be transacted without exporting a single ounce of gold or silver from america it is not contrary to justice that both ireland and america should contribute towards the discharge of the public debt of great britain the debt has been contracted in support of the government established by the revolution a government to which the protestants of ireland owe not only the whole authority which they at present enjoy in their own country but every security which they possess for their liberty their property and their religion a government to which several of the colonies of america owe their present charters and consequently their present constitution and to which all the colonies of america owe the liberty security and property which they have ever since enjoyed that public debt has been contracted in the defence not of great britain alone but of all the different provinces of the empire the immense debt contracted in the late war in particular and a great part of that contracted in the war before were both properly contracted in defence of america by a union with great britain ireland would gain besides the freedom of trade other advantages much more important 
and which would much more than compensate any increase of taxes that might accompany that union. By the union with England, the middling and inferior ranks of people in Scotland gained a complete deliverance from the power of an aristocracy, which had always before oppressed them. By a union with Great Britain, the greater part of people of all ranks in Ireland would gain an equally complete deliverance from a much more oppressive aristocracy, an aristocracy not founded, like that of Scotland, in the natural and respectable distinctions of birth and fortune, but in the most odious of all distinctions, those of religious and political prejudices, distinctions which, more than any other, animate both the insolence of the oppressors and the hatred and indignation of the oppressed and which commonly render the inhabitants of the same country more hostile to one another than those of different countries ever are. Without a union with Great Britain, the inhabitants of Ireland are not likely, for many ages, to consider themselves as one people. No oppressive aristocracy has ever prevailed in the colonies. Even they, however, would, in point of happiness and tranquillity, gain considerably by a union with Great Britain it would, at least, deliver them from those rancorous and virulent factions which are inseparable from small democracies, and which have so frequently divided the affections of their people, and disturbed the tranquillity of their governments, in their form so nearly democratical. In the case of a total separation from Great Britain, which, unless prevented by a union of this kind, seems very likely to take place, those factions would be ten times more virulent than ever." Before the commencement of the present disturbances, the coercive power of the mother country had always been able to restrain those factions from breaking out into anything worse than gross brutality and insult. If that coercive power were entirely taken away, they would probably soon break out into open violence and bloodshed. In all great countries which are united under one uniform government, the spirit of party commonly prevails less in the remote provinces than in the center of the empire. The distance of those provinces from the capital, from the principal seat of the great scramble of faction and ambition, makes them enter less into the views of any of the contending parties, and renders them more indifferent and impartial spectators of the conduct of all. The spirit of party prevails less in Scotland than in England. In the case of a union, it would probably prevail less in Ireland than in Scotland and the colonies would probably soon enjoy a degree of concord and unanimity at present unknown in any part of the british empire both ireland and the colonies indeed would be subjected to heavier taxes than any which they at present pay in consequence however of a diligent and faithful application of the public revenue towards the discharge of the national debt the greater part of those taxes might not be of long continuance and the public revenue of Great Britain might soon be reduced to what was necessary for maintaining a moderate peace establishment. The territorial acquisitions of the East India Company, the undoubted right of the crown, that is, of the state and people of Great Britain, might be rendered another source of revenue, more abundant, perhaps, than all those already mentioned. Those countries are represented as more fertile, more extensive, and, in proportion to their extent, much richer and more populous than Great Britain. In order to draw a great revenue from them, it would not probably be necessary to introduce any new system of taxation into countries which are already sufficiently, and more than sufficiently, taxed. It might perhaps be more proper to lighten than to aggravate the burden of those unfortunate countries, and to endeavor to draw a revenue from them, not by imposing new taxes, but by preventing the embezzlement and misapplication of the greater part of those which they already pay. If it should be found impracticable for Great Britain to draw any considerable augmentation of revenue from any of the resources above mentioned, the only resource which can remain to her is a diminution of her expense. In the mode of collecting, and in that of expending the public revenue, though in both there may be still room for improvement, Great Britain seems to be at least as economical as any of her neighbors. The military establishment which she maintains for her own defense in time of peace is more moderate than that of any European state, which can pretend to rival her either in wealth or in power. None of these articles, therefore, seem to admit of any considerable reduction of expense. The expense of the peace establishment of the colonies was, before the commencement of the present disturbances, very considerable and is an expense which may, and, if no revenue can be drawn from them, ought certainly to be, saved altogether. 
this constant expense in time of peace though very great is insignificant in comparison with what the defence of the colonies has cost us in time of war the last war which was undertaken altogether on account of the colonies cost great britain it has already been observed upwards of ninety millions the spanish war of seventeen thirty nine was principally undertaken on their account in which and in the french war that was the consequence of it great britain spent upwards of forty millions a great part of which ought justly to be charged to the colonies in those two wars the colonies cost great britain much more than double the sum which the national debt amounted to before the commencement of the first of them had it not been for those wars the debt might and probably would by this time have been completely paid and had it not been for the colonies the former of those wars might not and the latter certainly would not have been undertaken it was because the colonies were supposed to be provinces of the british empire that this expense was laid out upon them but countries which contribute neither revenue nor military force towards the support of the empire cannot be considered as provinces they may perhaps be considered as appendages as a sort of splendid and showy equipage of the empire but if the empire can no longer support the expense of keeping up this equipage it ought certainly to lay it down and if it cannot raise its revenue in proportion to its expense it ought at least to accommodate its expense to its revenue if the colonies notwithstanding their refusal to submit to british taxes are still to be considered as provinces of the british empire their defence in some future war may cost great britain as great an expense as it ever has done in any former war the rulers of great britain have for more than a century past amused the people with the imagination that they possessed a great empire on the west side of the atlantic this empire however has hitherto existed in imagination only it has hitherto been not an empire but the project of an empire not a gold mine but the project of a gold mine a project which has cost which continues to cost and which if pursued in the same way as it has been hitherto is likely to cost immense expense without being likely to bring any profit for the effects of the monopoly of the colony trade it has been shown are to the great body of the people mere loss instead of profit it is surely now time that our rulers should either realize this golden dream in which they have been indulging themselves perhaps as well as the people or that they should awake from it themselves and endeavour to awaken the people if the project cannot be completed it ought to be given up if any of the provinces of the british empire cannot be made to contribute towards the support of the whole empire it is surely time that great britain should free herself from the expense of defending those provinces in time of war and of supporting any part of their civil or military establishment in time of peace and endeavour to accommodate her future views and designs to the real mediocrity of her circumstances end of book five chapter three part c end of the wealth of nations by adam smith recorded by stephen escalera